Welcome to the next talk. Here we're going to talk about the pathology and pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. So if you take people at death, about up to 40-45% of people have pathology in their brain that is indistinguishable from Alzheimer's disease. So these are the plaques, which are this brown color, and these intracellular tangles we can see here on this plate. But for you to have a clinical dementia syndrome, you need other things. You need neuronal loss, uh, synaptic loss, and, uh, and then resultant um, atrophy. The distribution of plaques is not associated with neuropathology, but the distribution of tangles is associated with the types, the regions of the brain which seem to be malfunctioning, and that's how it presents as the psychology. So plaque is a beta pleated protein sheet. Uh, we think it might be a normal protective response to the stresses that are going on. But the current theory is that the uh, oligomeric amyloid beta proteins are the pathological process, and we'll talk about those. And it appears that these small bits of uh, oligomeric amyloid are what leads to glutaminergic synaptic loss. Glutaminergic synapses are the 80% of excitatory synapses in our brains. And these are the uh, things that we're imaging with FDG. And so there's a relationship there between the uptake of FDG and the glutaminergic synaptic loss associated with Alzheimer's disease. ApoE4. Uh, one of the genetic markers for uh, increased risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease also appears to act as a cofactor for these small protein fragments and their synaptic toxicity. If we look at the Roche Memory and Aging Project, uh, which is going to look at 1,200 uh, brains at death, uh, the first 141 brains uh, showed uh, a high proportion of mixed pathology, uh, and I think this is going to be one of uh, this is one of my things that I try to get over to people is how common mixed pathology is in what we have clinically defined as this type of dementia, that type of dementia, and they explicitly said that there was a poor relationship between pathological classification and the clinical assessment. One of the things that we do see, maybe underneath the uh, amyloid cascade hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease is something called oxidative stress. So we know that in early Alzheimer's disease pathology, we lose the large axons with a very high cell surface and high energy requirement. And if we look at altered uh, glucose metabolism, then we see that very early in Alzheimer's disease, both mitochondrial dysfunction, reactive oxygen species, and abnormal calcium homeostasis, all indicating that high oxidative stress. And we can even look further in, we can look at mitochondrial electron transport uh, chain levels, and we can show that these are reduced early in Alzheimer's disease in the posterior cingulate gyrus that we'll see is important in Alzheimer's disease assessment, the middle temporal lobe gyrus that I'll show you, and in the hippocampus. So if when we inject FDG into a patient, we know that what we're really imaging is the uh, distribution of glucose transporters, uh, we see massive hyper-upregulation in many of the carcinomas. Uh, 
and the uh, tumours in which we see very little uh, FDG uptake don't have this upregulation of glucose transporters. So what do we see in the brain? We see that the glucose transporter 1 is distributed at the blood-brain barrier, glucose transporter 3 on the neuron, and GLUT2 on the astrocyte. The expression of glucose transporters around the uh, body, including the brain, is uh, increased by HIF1-alpha, the cytosolic inducible dimer. Uh, we have very little understanding or no understanding of uh, how we control HIF1-alpha in the brain. Much better understanding in uh, carcinomas. So what do we see in Alzheimer's disease with the glucose transporters? We see reduced glucose transporter 1 in the blood-brain barrier and 3 on the neurons, indicating pathology here. We see an increase in glucose transporter 2. This increased astrocyte response, increased astrocyte numbers is common in many brain pathologies. We see a measurement called o N acylization as a correlation of tau protein hyperphosphorylation. And as the glucose 1 and 3 goes down, then this measure of tau protein hyperphosphorylation increases. We see the density of neurofibrillar tangles is inversely proportional to glucose transporter 1 and 3. So the neurofibrillar tangles are one of the inflammatory response around the deposition of amyloid. And the distribution of neurofibrillar tangles is related to the symptom in patients. So what we're seeing is a relationship in the symptoms that patients present with, changes in the glucose transporter expression in the brain related to the primary pathology in Alzheimer's disease. And this is what FDG is imaging. Here I want to introduce you to um, the uh, now well-established idea of staging of Alzheimer's disease. So here we have a model which suggests that as we go from cognitively normal to mild cognitive impairment to true dementia, then we have these changes which are happening at different stages. So we see the distribution of uh, amyloid early on to form the neurofibrillar tangles and the plaques. We have tau-mediated neuronal injury and dysfunction as a part of an amyloid cascade hypothesis. We see neuronal loss, loss of synapses and therefore brain structure uh, as we extend through this staging process, we see early reduction in memory, and then later we see the reduced activities of daily living. We'll try and come back to this model uh, elsewhere. So what does uh, beta amyloid come from? Well, it comes from amyloid precursor protein, which I think is what a very strange name for something uh, which is appears to be ubiquitous in from annelid worms to Oz. Uh, and we do not know what it does. We know that it's cleaved, that it forms these oligomers, which lead to synaptic impairment, then forms into these beta pleated sheets, which then produce the plaques the new, and the neuritis around it and the inflammation. A more recent uh, assessment has shown that with the upregulation of amyloid precursor protein endocytosis, uh, we can see this in neuronal aging. And therefore, there appears to be a clear association with amyloid precursor protein and neuronal loss as part of the amyloid cascade hypothesis. 
here I want to measure the uh, CRAD, CRAD uh, criteria for the definition of Alzheimer's disease. So CRAD defines age, the neuritic plaque score, and the clinical history of dementia as the definition for Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that is involved there is this neuritic plaque score where pathologically we either have non or sparse levels of um, neuritic plaques and that is um, not indicative of Alzheimer's disease pathologically and moderate to frequent plaque density which is uh, remember from the very first slide we showed that these moderate frequent plaques can be present in people who do not clinically have dementia, but then, then starts to open up the staging process that we've already discussed. I want to talk about some of the important regions in the brain. You can review the Brodmann areas of the brain. Uh, these are really cytoarchitecture areas, and they're often essential for understanding some of the literature. Uh, some of the important ones are listed here, but we're not going to overly worry about this. Uh, what we're going to uh, uh, talk about are some of the important regions that we think we need to know, and which we'll, we've already talked a little bit about uh, in the assessment of the reporting. So we're definitely going to want to define the frontal region, parietal, occipital and temporal lobes. Uh, but there are other regions that we also need to be aware of when assessing FTG pet CT in dementia. The primary sensory cortex can be a cytologically protected region in the intrinsic neurodegenerative dementias. And in the temporal lobe itself, we're going to be aware of the superior, middle, and inferior temporal lobe gyrus. There are also important regions on the medial part of the brain. So this is the posterior cingulate gyrus uh, in this region, uh, and the uh, precuneus region here. So the precuneus region is between the parieto occipital sulcus and the uh, sulcus of Rolando. Uh, we also uh, can make some assessment of the anterior cingulate gyrus, especially with statistical parametric mapping. There are also three regions of high intensity, which in a normal brain are often very uh, similar intensity. And this is around the primary visual cortex, the calcarine fissure, calcarine sulcus, the parieto occipital cortex, and the posterior cingulate gyrus. Before we finish this part, I want to go back to the Roche Memory Project. This looked at 141 clinically defined Alzheimer's disease patients and showed that the commonest pathology was mixed pathology, Alzheimer's and vascular disease. And this is uh, also replicated elsewhere in, in European brain banks and elsewhere. And again, they suggested that the clinical classification is a poor indicator of pathological disease. As we are imaging pathological disease, uh, then this can create tension between the referral characteristics, uh, the clinical assessment, and what you're imaging. So we can start to see some of these low attenuation deep white matter changes and start to diagnose true mixed dementia. So thank you for listening again, and uh, we'll go on to the next talk.